How old was I when I wrote my first book? 23. He said 23. I'm just echoing. I'm just doing an echo. 20. I got a 20. Do I 22? I was 14 years old. How many pages was it? 479. Four. It was about 300 pages long, single spaced, typed, both sides of the paper, because my mom was real cheap. She said, stop wasting my paper on this nonsense, okay? You're 14 years old. That was my very first book. When did I write my next book? How old was I? First book at 14, when did I write my next book? 16. 20, you love that number. Are you waiting for that age? You love that number. My lottery tickets tonight are 20, 23, 16. 38. Now to write a double space, 300 page manuscript typed on both sides, you kind of have to like what you're doing, don't you? You kind of have to be enjoying what's going on. I did. I loved it. I knew from that age what I wanted to be, but you know, all of a sudden I'm 38 years old and I hadn't written another one. You know why? I wasn't in prison. I didn't go into a coma. No one had kidnapped me and tied me up in their basement. I succumbed to the demon. The little voice that says you're not good enough, smart enough, talented enough, lucky enough. Nothing happened until I turned around and told that little voice that is in all of us and in me, and it was very strong in me, until I turned around and told that little voice to shut the you-know-what up. And when I did, and when I did, I wrote a book that sold to 14 countries, 12 languages, Warner Brothers Motion Pictures will be making a movie. Yeah, you can clap. Go ahead and clap. You know, you hear, you're going to hear a lot from adults about follow your dreams. Always believe in yourself. You know? And that's true. I'm not making fun of that. But it's too easy to say to you guys, this is a personal battle. There's no easy formula. You have to find your own way to get rid of that demon, to exercise it. So you can become whatever sort of hero you're meant to become. Okay, this is one of the great, th I'm a grown man, obviously. One of the great things about my job is I get to act it out because, you know, you were acting, asking how I write it. I actually act out scenes. There's a climactic scene in the first book. You've read it. He ends up in the cave of Merlin, this secret hideout-like cave underneath Camelot. Right, I'm not spoiling anything. There's this great climactic sword fight between Alfred and the bad guy. And I had trouble visualizing all those things. So finally, in my desperation, I decided to act it out. So no one was home, thank goodness. I put a CD from an action movie called Speed in the CD player, the soundtrack from that movie. It's a great soundtrack. Went upstairs, got my kid's play sword, came back downstairs. And I was both parts. I was Alfred, and I was the bad guy. And I'd, get, I'd do a certain sequence, I'd run back to my computer, my laptop, and I'd write that scene, including dialogue. I'd do the dialogue, too. I got way up to the point where, you know, Al I don't want to, you know, this won't ruin it. Alfred actually gets stabbed, run through. So I got to that point, and I realized I was stuck, because obviously, you know, you get run through with a sword, you're, it's... So I was like caught. I was like trapped myself. I was standing up against a wall in my house with the wooden sword underneath my left armpit, like I was impaled. And I was just kind of hanging there thinking. And I happened to glance up, and there was a row of windows right there. And there was a little old man walking his dog. <laughs> Only neither the old man nor the dog were walking. They were both standing, and both of them were looking at me with a very quizzical expression. 
So, you know, I did what any normal, rational person would do in a situation like that. I said, what? What? What is the big deal? What? Like, you've never done that. He, um, he left, and I never saw him again. I don't know where he went. But sometimes I would embarrass my kids because I'd actually, you know, go outside because they would be in the house and I didn't want to disturb anybody and I would do scenes outside, including humming my own theme music. You know, laugh at me now, but, you know, they're going to make a movie. And my kid one day actually opened up the, the, the upstairs window in his bedroom and he said, would you please stop? It's embarrassing. Well, the first name. The first name I wanted to sound close to Arthur, but I didn't want it to be Arthur. So Alfred was pretty good. Crop, uh, Crop happened this way. I was trying to think of his last name, and I went into my kitchen to pour a cup of coffee. And I was, you know, I've been racking my brain all morning for a name. And I looked down at my coffee maker, and it's made by a company called Krups. K-R-U-P-S. And I went, Krups, hmm, Krups, 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 Krups. And I went back to the computer and I started typing, you know, playing around with variations. And I came up with K-R-U-P-P, -P, Krupp. And I said it together and I thought it sounded great. Alfred Krupp. I thought that sounds memorable. It sounds funny. Just saying the name makes you kind of want to laugh or smile. So we were about a month away from publication. They were about to ship the books. And I got this frantic call from my publisher, the people who published the books. It was my editor, and she said, we've got a big problem. And I said, what? And she said, did you know there is a real Alfred Krupp? <laughs> and immediately I thought, I'm going to be sued. <laughs> Somebody's going to get upset that I made him 15 years old with a big head, <laughs> stealing something from a high-tech office building. And I said, well, is he upset? He must know about the book. She said, I don't know if he's upset or not because he's dead. And I was just flooded with relief. I said, well, dead people can't sue you, can they? I mean, this is America. Actually, they may be able to. I don't know if that... But anyway, she said, no, I don't, you know, no. Yeah, he's dead. But how well do you know your World War II history? And I said, I guess not well enough. So I know about Hitler, I know about Nazis, I know about the Japanese, I know about the atomic bomb, I don't, you know, what? She said, Alfred Krupp was a real person. He was a German arms manufacturer. He was the one who built Hitler's war machine. She said, I'm not sure, though I'm pretty sure, that we do not want to publish a major young adult novel whose protagonist has the same name as a Nazi. We may want to rethink that. So I said, okay, sure, let's read. That just threw everybody into a panic because it would be like you wake up, what, hey, Mr. 20, 20, hey, 20. What's your, what's your name? What's your first name? It's not a trick question, Norse. It's like tomorrow morning you get up and your parents say, you know what? We made a big mistake with the Norris thing. Your name's Bert. <laughs> Can you imagine trying to adjust to that new reality? It'd be tough. It's the same thing for a writer who creates a character and becomes very close to that character and very intimate with that character to the point that where that character is like one of their own, one of their own kids. It's like changing their child's name. So it just sent us into all a bunch of agony. We were looking up names in phone books. We were looking up, you know, names in the internet. We were trying to come up with a name. We wanted to keep Alfred. Finally, I decided it was actually my wife's idea. I called up my editor and I said, let's just keep it very, very simple. Let's change the U to an O. Is there any Nazi, living or dead, that was named Alfred Krop? Any serial killers? Any, you know? So they did some research. They found out, yeah, we can use that name. Now, interestingly enough, my middle child, he's 16 now, at the time he was 15, about your guy's age. He wanted to change one letter too in the last name. He wanted to change the U to an A. Uh, 